Greetings, fellow aliens. Welcome to the 12th episode of Earthlings 101. Today we will learn about the Earthlings' most important sense, vision. Vision is the capacity to perceive light in order to create a mental image of the environment. But what is light? Light is electromagnetic radiation within a certain range. The Earth atmosphere filters most radiation from the sun, except for three ranges of wavelengths, the radio window, the infrared window, and the optical window. The latter is between 300 and 1100 nanometers, that's the frequency of light. Earthlings can perceive light between 390 and 700 nanometers, that's called visible light. The earthlings perceive light with their eyes, a pair of globular organs in the head. Eyes are primitive bio cameras, light falls through a lens, is focused onto a photosensitive layer called retina, is transformed into electrical signals, and then, well, that's when things become interesting. Earthling sensors are often compared with the sensor system of levy drones. When the Galactic Tax Authority executes a planetary tax examination, it sends in a tax star, which releases millions of levy drones onto the planet's surface. Each levy drone is equipped with a multitude of tax assessment sensors, including a sophisticated high-definition camera. On first glance, a drone camera seems to work exactly like an earthling eye, light falls through a lens system onto an array of spectroscopic photoreceptors. The spectroscopic pixel matrix is then sent to the central computer where it is processed and transformed into a 3D voxel model. Finally, the tax routines compute the monetary value of each taxable entity. If you take this, minus the tax part, you get a very good explanation of how earthling vision does not work. Because, from the moment on when the light hits the retina, earthling vision is completely different. In particular, what the eyes send to the brain is not only pixel data, but also data about contrast, color contrast and motion. In other words, the first step of data processing happens literally within the eyes. See, the retina consists of light-sensitive cells, rods and cones. Above those cells we have a thin layer of intermediate neurons, which wire them to the neurocables leading to the brain. Some neurons simply forward information from the rods and cones, but others provide a clever lateral wiring to detect contrast or motion. For example, one neuron might emit a signal when a certain spot is brighter than its neighborhood. In consequence, the cell detects contrast, or, in other words, contours. Another neuron might only fire when it detects motion in a certain direction. Still another neuron emits a signal when it perceives a color difference between neighbor spots, and so on. So, what is sent to the brain is information about motion, contrast and color contrast. But where is the information sent? The eyes are wired to the thalamus, in the center of the brain. Thalamus is an ancient word for inner chamber, and it's kind of a data connection center. Whoever sends information to the brain must pass through the thalamus. In particular, the eyes are wired to the two lateral geniculate nuclei, that's just a fancy word for knee-shaped bumps on the side. The right bump receives data from the right halves of the retina of both eyes, the left bump from the left halves. The information is then forwarded to the visual cortex in the back of the brain where it is processed and sent to the rest of the brain. Spatial and motion data are sent upwards, where they serve to create a dynamic 3D model of the environment. Color and shape information is sent sidewards and used to identify objects. Scientific advice. An interesting field of research is optical illusions. Take this one, for example. When you tell an earthling to fix the planet in the center of the image, he will see a green orbiting saucer in the rotating free slot between the pink ones, although there is no green saucer, only pink ones. The green is an after image of the pink, maybe due to the color contrast vision I will explain later. Sometimes the pink saucers will even disappear and he will only see the green one. Earthlings always center both eyes onto one spot in the visual field. The centers of the retina have the highest density of cones and provide the sharpest view. The farther you are away from the center, the brighter the vision gets. That's why earthlings always move their eyes around. The brain does a good job in computing the movement away, so the environment appears static. But this doesn't work when you poke the eyeball slightly with a finger, in this case the world seems to move. As mentioned before, the data received by the visual cortex are used for two purposes, spatial orientation and motion data, and identifying objects. Let's start with the former one. 
for spatial orientation, having two eyes comes in handy, the brain uses the slight differences between the data from both eyes to estimate the distance of different objects. Other input data are also taken into account, in particular the smaller angular size of distant objects. The brain uses those data to construct a dynamic 3D model of the environment. Most animals have similar visual systems. Predators often have frontal eyes with overlapping fields of view, to provide an optimal 3D vision in order to seize their prey. Prey animals, on the other hand, have often lateral eyes to increase the field of view, so they can detect whoever wants to eat them. Except for, the microbes. <laughs> now to the second point, identifying objects. This happens in the temporal cortex, that's just a fancy word for on the sides of the head. Earthling brains are powerful pattern recognition machines. We have already seen that the eyes send contour data to the brain. What happens is that identified simple contour patterns, corners, edges etc, are assembled into more and more complex patterns. Earthlings are great at identifying shapes even from incomplete contour elements. That's important, for example for identifying partially hidden animals. When the initial contour elements are not properly aligned, the brain has problems assembling the overall shape. Those lines, for example, appear as spirals, but they are actually circles. The pattern recognition of faces is well developed, as it contributes to the recognition of individuals. Earthling scientists have identified a neuron in a brain that reacts to the celebrity Halle Berry, but not to images of other earthlings. The neuron also reacts to Halle Berry in a feline costume covering most of her face, as well as to her name. So, this cell seems to be a really big fan of Halle Berry. They also found a neuron that likes Jennifer Aniston, and another one that admires Ronald Reagan. Recognition of things is mainly based on to shape and color. The concept of color can be confusing for aliens. Most educated earthlings would agree that color is a physical property of light. But as we will see, that is utter nonsense. Color isn't about physics, it's about biology. Earthling color perception can be compared to how the glue bobs of Aldrey's 7 perceive sound. Glue bobs are known for having the worst brass bands in the galaxy. It's not their fault, those creatures have a very primitive audio perception and can only distinguish three ranges of frequencies, called Jed, Bleen, and Drew. Every sound, every chord or melody they hear will be reduced in their ears to a mix of Jed, Bleen and Drew. The glue bob ears contain sound receptors for each one of the three pitch ranges. The sensibilities of the receptors are somewhat fuzzy, so they can tell single sounds apart. For example, when you play a scale, glue bobs hear this, but they are completely lost when it comes to chords. To notes are already too much. Take for example a chord consisting of Jed and Bleen, for glue bob ears, that sounds exactly like Nello, halfway between Jed and Bleen. So, for glue bobs, Jed plus Bleen equals Nello, which is of course nonsense. The only thing that is equal is the perception of the sounds by glue bob ears. Glue bob scientists have theorized that all sounds belong to a three-dimensional sound space, defined by the perceived intensity of Jed, Bleen and Drew. Mind, this isn't physics, it's biology. Glue bob sound recording devices can only produce three sounds, enough to imitate sounds for glue bob ears, but not for everybody else. The same holds for glue bob instruments, hence the bad brass bands. Why am I telling you this? Because earthling vision works the same. Earthlings have only three kinds of color receptors, often called, not quite correctly, red, green and blue. Even the most complex combination of frequencies are reduced by earthling eyes to a combination of red, green and blue. For example, earthlings cannot distinguish between monochromatic yellow light and a mix of red and green light. In both cases, the red and green receptors are excited in the same way. That's why earthlings say that red plus green equals yellow. This is biology, not physics. In other words, color isn't a physical property, it only exists in the brain. Actually, the expression red receptor is misleading, this receptor speak is rather in the green-yellow range. This reduces an effect called chromatic aberration. But anyway, what is sent to the brain is not the raw receptor response but color contrast data, more precisely, yellow-blue contrast, red-green contrast, and luminosity contrast. But what is the advantage of sending color contrast data? To understand this, we have to understand what color actually is. When you ask educated adult earthlings what color is, they will probably brabble something about frequencies, color circles and additive color blending. 
but when you ask earthling cubs, they will talk about blue teddies, yellow flowers and pink sofas. In other words, they see color not as a property of light, but as a property of objects. And that's actually a much better approach. See, when an earthling has a pink car, it will always be a pink car, no matter how it is lit. Earthling visions relies on whatever light source is available. The reflected light might differ, but for the earthling, his car will always have the same color. So, the word pink doesn't actually describe light, it describes how the surface reacts to varying light, as perceived by the earthling eye. So, color is a property of surfaces, which exists only in the brain. How is this even possible? Well, what happens is that the brain takes the sensor information and computes the lighting away. What remains is a perceived property of surfaces, an imaginary material invariant, color. Here, the color contrast data comes in handy, no matter the lighting, a pink sofa is always pinker than the green carpet it is standing on. Color is a good example of how earthlings construct a model of reality in their brain. Physical objects are collections of atoms with properties like shape, size and spectral characteristics of the surface. But the brain can't directly access to those properties, all it has is sensor information. So it takes this information, computes factors like lighting and distance away, and constructs simplified models of the objects in the world. The imaginary properties of the object models correspond more or less to physical reality. Size and shape are rather accurate approximation of an object's actual geometry, but color is a rough simplification of its spectral characteristics. So, color is an imaginary property of materials. This makes sense, as the main purpose of color is actually the identification of materials. Color allows finding things like flintstone, fertile earth or ripe fruits. The brain takes out the lighting information to obtain the lighting invariant color and tell different materials apart, even if the reflected light is actually the same. Colors have a high symbolic meaning. Blue is perceived as calm and cool, as lakes and oceans are blue. Green is associated with nature, because plants are green. Yellow is perceived as joyful and energetic, because Earth orbits a yellow star. Red is associated with violence and danger, as red is the color of fire and blood. Fictional characters are sometimes color-coded for easy identification. Cartoon characters can often be identified with little more than color information, even humanized animals. This works also for some live-action characters, especially when they wear some sort of uniform. Colors play also an important part in Earthlings' social life. For example, lovers like to give each other colorful flowers. There isn't any practical sense, as you can't eat flowers. There is an old saying amongst alien anthropologists, if it doesn't make sense, it's probably a ritual. Tips for tourists If you want to watch an Earthling movie, don't expect realistic colors. Earthling cameras can only record three color components. Personally, I find black and white movies less disturbing. Above all, stay away from so-called 3D movies, especially if you have only one eye. It shall be noted that some female Earthlings have four types of cones instead of three. In Earthling terms, they have a four-dimensional color space. There are also accounts on individuals able to perceive an additional color called octarine. But the same accounts also report an unregistered habitable planar superstructure with biopropulsion, as well as other oddities, so this is probably fiction. Anyway, this is nothing compared with an aquatic animal called the mantis shrimp which has a 16-dimensional color space. Strategic Advice Mantis shrimps would make a good base to breed super soldiers, their color vision would make earthling camouflage useless. They have sharp appendages they can accelerate to the speed of earthlings weapons projectiles, they wear a natural body armor, and they can move so fast that the liquid around them starts boiling. However, you might want to do something about their size. I will conclude with an open question, spectral violet, the light at the upper end of the visual spectrum, is allegedly perceived as slightly reddish. That's why earthlings bend the spectrum to a circle, the color wheel. But violet light is far off the so-called red receptors, why is it perceived as reddish? I see two possibilities. Either the red receptors have a second bump in the violet zone. Or spectral violet isn't actually perceived as reddish blue, but as deep blue, and the name violet is actually a misnomer. The fact that computer screens can't display spectral violet might add to the confusion. I honestly don't know. So I'll ask my earthling viewers, what do you think? And if you have, say, access to a violet laser, or a violet light weapon, does spectral violet actually appear reddish, or rather deep blue? If it's reddish, how comes? If it's deep blue, why the color wheel? This was the 12th episode of Earthlings 101.
Next time we will speak about earthling mathematics, a science of truth, space, numbers, and the gender of globlings. Thanks for watching, click a like if you liked it, and as always, don't forget to be alien.